then I had mixed an EP for a band, a Texas band called Sixpence None the Rich, Richer, who had done a few records already, and um, and it went great, and um, called Tickets for a Prayer Wheel, and um, they got in a really bad record company situation. Um, I don't remember all the details. All I know is it was unethical and, and unfair, and they had attorneys fighting to get them out, but it was gonna be a lengthy process, and Steve um, became friends with Matt and, um, and they start talking and Matt's written all these songs and they want to put out another record and, um, but they're not able to do one because of the record label thing. So Steve um, comes to me and says, man, I think we're going to do a record that we got to keep under the, you know, uh, we can't really let the word out that we're doing it, but we're going to, without letting anybody know, make a whole record on this band because we got attorneys fighting and Steve was helping pay to get the attorneys to get them out of the deal. But until we get out of the deal, we can't do anything because they'll end up, you know, coming, confiscating all the tapes and potentially putting somebody in jail or something. So we're looking at a place to do this record. And um, there was a studio on Music Row that had been called Sanctuary Recording. And that's where we had tracked, well, we had done another Newsboys record after that called Tickman Your Leader. Um, and uh, we had done it at Sanctuary and Steve and I had loved working there. And, um, and the way we were kind of working with the carport is we were tracking, our plan was always go a couple of weeks to another studio, a big studio track there, and then go back to the carport for all of our overdubs and mix. And um, cause it's just pretty small and it's basically a control room and one other room and, um, and but plenty of space to do guitar overdubs or vocals or anything like that. So that was our routine way of working. And um, the, uh, Takes me your take me to your leader record was the biggest uh, at that point the biggest record Newsboys had ever had and um, went uh, platinum and um, I didn't mix it but Tom Lord Algy mixed it which was uh, I was a big fan of his so I was excited to have him mix a record and I got to hang out with him a fair amount while he was working which was great and um, and then we jump in on this six pence and the richer record well we're trying to figure out where to uh, do it and it turns out we. We're, we looked at Sanctuary, and Sanctuary has went out of business. They've closed down. It's an abandoned building. And um, Steve's like, well, wait, maybe we could rent the building for a month, and we've already got all this gear at the carport. We could bring in, maybe buy a few more things, but have enough yeah. gear to, to <laughs> set up a tracking studio. Um, so we go into the studio and look, and it has been because somebody was looking at buying it or remodeling it, but they've went through and cut with knives all the fabric on the walls to see what was behind it because they were assuming that it was not going to be used but it's pretty trashed up because of all this people digging in behind walls and tearing into them to see what stuff's made out of so we set up in there we decided we ran it for um i can't remember if it was one or two months but we rent it for i mean for nothing 1500 bucks or something a, a month to um in its terrible um state um to to record this record ironically the one building, I don't know what direction it is, west of the studio is their label. So when we are sitting in the control room, we are literally about 75 feet from the president of their label that if he had any idea we were recording, he would have went crazy. But, um, but of course, we're not going to tell him. So we're like even watching when we're driving into the studio every day and just trying to keep it completely quiet. But... <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, we get through the whole thing and, um, and record, we rented a, uh, uh, API sidecar, uh, RS Field, who's an amazing producer in town, um, used to have this, uh, I guess it was a, I don't remember if it was 12 or 16 channels, but this little, I think it was 16 channel API sidecar that just was uh, sounded amazing so we rented that to track through and then supplemented it with all the other gear that we had and um uh and then recorded the the record there and then we went back to the carport and um and did the overdubs and i mixed it at the carport and uh and there's and then steve's pitching and steve's got a manager he's working with and they're pitching the album trying to get a label to pick it up and they can't well they're pitching it they, they got to be careful about how they pitch it because they can't let the other label know and they're trying to keep it secret and all this stuff and I don't remember the exact timeline but I know the lawsuit or the uh, the legal battles ended and the band was free to go so now we can do anything we want with the record um, 
but for whatever reason, we can't get another label or Steve can't get another label to pick it up. So Steve just decides, man, and he believes in this record 100%. He goes, this is going to be a huge record. I'm going to put it out myself. So all of a sudden, he starts checking into funding and he starts this label. He starts a label called Squint Entertainment and he's going to put out with two employees and um, and uh, and they're going to put this, this record out. And uh, the record uh, comes out and... For, for them, it's doing great because I don't think they'd ever sold more than forty or fifty thousand. But it's uh, it's not an instant success. But it's building slowly and slowly, and um, I guess it got up to about seventy five thousand units, and uh, and they hire a it got some kind of a placement in some TV show, and then got some interest uh, from some program directors. I guess they hired an independent promoter or something, but the deal was the guy told him, he goes, listen, I need something, a name that I can tie to this. He goes, it's an unknown band, unknown producer, unknown mix engineer. I need to be able to have one known factor in there somewhere. So before I pitch it, I would suggest you get somebody to remix the single and that'll make it much easier to get radio to play. So, um, which, uh, they decide Bob Clearmountain is going to remix three of the tunes. The, the single, which is a song called Kiss Me, yeah. and the next two songs, which uh, are going to be the next singles. And um, and Steve has always been really great about all this and this kind of stuff. And he goes, man, we're going to get Bob to do it. Man, can you come out and be there for the mix session and everything out else? And I was like, of course. And then my wife was not so keen on it since it was they were going out the day after we got back from our honeymoon. So, um, uh, but Steve actually begged my wife and said, listen, this is a really big deal for him. You've got to let him do this. So I ended up not going the day I got back, but waiting a day and then going and got to hang out. Um, we had Bob Claremont's studio, uh, while he mixed and, uh, and hear amazing stories about him working with David Bowie and the Rolling Stones and uh, Brian Adams and all these crazy great records he mixed. But, uh, and he was all about, because he didn't have very many technical people come by. He was all about telling the stories and stuff and was just the nicest guy in the world and was real respectful of my mixes that he was remixing them. He listened to them ahead of time and, uh, and, and really recreated the mix. It felt to me a lot like it was basically my mix with a way better sounding vocal and a way better sounding snare and, uh, and a little bit sounding better sounding everything else. But still, he retained most of the panning and everything I had done, which I thought was a real big uh, compliment. And um, and so then the album goes back out and it's mixed by Bob Clearmountain. And all of a sudden the person, the consultant or whoever was right because everybody starts playing this, uh, oh, yeah. Kiss Me Like Crazy. And uh, it became a uh, number one song relatively quick. And, um, and then be- went on to become a number one song in nine countries. And, um, uh, the um, uh, used to when I would drive to a studio in the morning I would every day get in the car start scrolling through stations and my whole goal was to see how many different stations I could hear Kiss Me on before I got to the studio where I was going and a lot of times it would be four or five stations yeah. I would hear this song yeah. played on before I got to uh, the studio uh, where I was going to be working at which was just crazy and then my wife and I went on vacation to Europe and um, we heard it in England, we heard it in Germany, we heard it in Austria, and... Um, so did she feel a little bit better about the whole... She felt way situation? better about it. <laughs> I mean, uh, of all the songs it could have been to have that story... Yeah, yeah so it was, good one. it was That's crazy. Special. And the thing that kept going through my head was, because this had been done in... The, we did the vocals for that in the carport. And so I'm in Austria and hearing this song on the radio, and all that I can think is... That vocal was recorded in my garage. That vocal was recorded in my garage. That vocal was recorded in my garage. And just can't believe that we're in the other side of the world hearing a vocal that was recorded in my garage. (laughs) 